Hi everybody, um, it's Melissa coming to you live again for from the clinic to the living room. Um, it's been a while. Um, it's nice to um, be back in my actual living room and not still at work. Um, I'm going to scoot my body over a little bit because I'm now reading, realizing that you can probably see my laundry basket in the background. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking tonight about the most common side effects with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Um, I see I got some people joining. Um, so just for the sake of not giving too much attention to one specific group, because there are actually three different combinations of BRAF MEK made by three different drug companies. Hi, Margie. I just saw you earlier. Um, we are going to talk in generalizations tonight just because one, I don't want to, you know, biasly talk about one versus the other. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing all three of these drug drug class groups um, get FDA approved. So um, I do have experience with all three groupings. Um, so we're just going to try to speak in rather generalizations. I'm going to try very hard to get to um, all of your questions, because I'm assuming we're going to get a lot of questions tonight, too. Um, so right when we start, about 50% of all skin melanomas harbor the, harbor the BRAF mutation um, and the BRAF V600E mutation specifically. So um, these drugs are getting a lot of use, both in a adjuvant setting as well as in a metastatic setting. Um, some of the side effects are difficult to manage and it's been a learning curve over the years. And so um, there's not a set of guidelines necessarily on, you know, if you get nausea, you do A, then B, then C, then D, then E. Um, so a lot of the recommendations that you're gonna hear tonight are based upon me doing a whole lot of research, um, having personal experience in our clinic with dealing with them. So, um, you know, just keep in mind that all, not all oncologists or treating physicians are going to treat these side effects exactly the same. Um, you know, certainly this is an art. It, you know, side effects can be managed many different ways. There's lots of ways to skin this cat. So don't worry if I, you know, mention how to deal with something and that's not the way that your oncologist dealt with it because that doesn't mean that it's wrong, just so that you know. Um, so now that I see we got some people and we're here, hi, Miss Julie, um, we are going to start by saying there's three different groups. So we have, um, Zelbaraf and Cotelic, which I'm going to refer to in this little lecture, um, as Vemurafenib or Vemu and Kobe. Um, in our specific clinic, we refer to everything by their generic names, just so that you know. Um, and then the second group um, that got approved um, is Dabrafenib and Trametinib. Um, that's Tafenlar and Mechanist. And then you have Ankorafenib and Benimetinib, which are the third group, um, or Ankobini. Also, um, Mectovi, Braftovi are what they're referred to. So you might hear me refer to these as any one of those names. Um, and I'm going to, like I said, try to just speak in generalizations. There are some side effects that are very specific to certain drug combos. Um, and when we get to that, I will point that out too. If anyone gets confused, just mention in the comments and we will certainly unconfuse you as much as we can. Um, so um, for sure, I see a lot of people that I recognize that write, watch a lot of our videos. So um, if you have comments, if you have questions, just as a, you know, introduction, please feel free to ask. I will try to get to as many things as I can um, outside of what I have prepared. Um, if I don't get to your question or for some reason I don't feel like I can answer it live on the um, live on the air, um, you know, I will address that as well. And, and um, you can always reach me via AIM um, with my 1-800 number or via email, okay? So um, just to get started, um, there are many side effects of, of these medications. They can all be well managed either by adding other pharmaceutical agents, adjusting timing of taking the medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also sometimes dose reductions are necessary. So um, even though you may have some side effects from these medications, there's certainly many things that they can do or we can do to make sure that we can tolerate these for a year. So 
Just to kind of start out, one of the most common side effects that um, are seen with the BRAF and MEK inhibitor combination um, are rashes um, or the dermatologic um, adverse events. Um, this can take the form of rashes, it can be dry skin, it can be um, increased keratin formation like calluses. Um, we see that quite a bit. Um, alopecia is sometimes seen. Um, it's usually a diffuse alopecia or hair falling out where like you don't just lose like a little piece, you lose like all of your hair, eyebrows, eyelashes, everything. Um, that's actually extremely uncommon, um, but it can happen as a side effect. Um, there also is some level of photosensitivity seen with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, and what that means is that when you take these meds, they make you more sensitive to sun exposure, both radiation, aka, you know, cyber knife, gamma knife, external beam radiation, but also UV radiation from the sun. So um, you see this more with um, the vemurafenib um, and catelic combination, and more specifically, you see this more with vemurafenib in, by itself as a single agent. Um, it's not as much of a problem with the other things, but there is a warning and um, one of the safety profiles is basically if you're getting radiation, you should hold um, application of the BRAF and MEK inhibitors for the, we recommend the day before the day of radiation and the day after just to be safe because it can cause some pretty significant um, liver toxicity um, from that. So one warning just to keep in mind. Um, as far as the rashes are concerned, they can take on a couple different forms. And actually, um, you see more of a maculopapular. And what that really means is that it can be raised or flat um, rash that can sometimes be extremely itchy um, or look even like a hive. We oftentimes see those types of rashes from the BRAF inhibitors as opposed to the MEK inhibitors cause more of an acne form rash or a rash that has you know, pustule formation. It's actually one way that we can tell which of the two medications is causing the rash because if it has more of an acne appearance, it's probably from the MEK inhibitor. If it has more of a hive-like or bumpy material look to it, um, the most likely thing is that it's from the BRAF inhibitor. Um, you can also see almost like an eczema-like formation or dry, dryness of the skin. Um, there's something called keratosis pilaris, which is just a hardening of like the hair follicles on like the outsides of the arms and sometimes on the face. Um, that can certainly happen. Um, very rarely, uh, the BRAF inhibitor part of it can cause a Steven Johnson-like reaction um, or like erythema multiform, which is like blistering of the skin. That's an extremely... Um, dangerous, worrisome finding. Um, a lot of times patients will need to have their drugs stopped altogether, um, sometimes admitted for things like hydration. So obviously any kind of blistering rash needs to be brought to the attention of your attending, you know, treating physician right away. Um, otherwise, in managing rashes, a lot of times um, topical steroids will be used as first line, especially in patients that have the rash from BRAF inhibitors. Um, we'll use things like emollients, like really thick um, lotions, um, things that have um, either, um, what's it, urea or glycosides, um, but a really thick lotion to moisturize because that's extremely helpful. It helps cut down on the itch. Um, but also topical steroids. So this is an extremely um, at-home, over-the-counter thing you can do right away. The other thing that we recommend to our patients a lot of times is to use antihistamines. Um, that histamine response that causes inflammation, um, sometimes just by dampening that, if by taking a daily antihistamine or even a daily um, H2 blocker like Pepsid um, for periods where the rash is extremely bad will be extremely helpful in preventing some of that paritis or irritation. Um, we then will move to topical steroids. So if antihistamines and topical lotions don't work, um, then we add topical steroids to try to get that inflammatory response down. Now, if you would come in with rash from the tip of your head to the bottom of your toes, most likely those things are not going to work um, and your doctor may prescribe a low dose of or um, short course of steroids like a Medrol dose pack um, and then consider you know, reducing the dose. Um, a lot of times the rash especially the BRAF inhibitor part of the rash is extremely dose dependent. So by just decreasing that 
that um, dose, um, one dose tier on any of the medications seems to really make a huge impact um, in the appearance of the rash. Now, if the rash is acneiform or coming from the MAC or thought to be coming from the MEC inhibitor, um, those rashes actually respond really well to topical and oral um, antibiotics. One of the ones that is most commonly used orally is um, doxycycline. Now, it can cause a lot of GI upset, so we try to split the dose up. Instead of 100 milligrams once a day, we'll try to do 50 milligrams twice a day. It's much better tolerated and actually is extremely effective for this type of rash, but also dose, dose reduction um, in persistent rashes will also help. Um, okay, so that's the generally easy rashes. Um, one question that I get a lot, and it's kind of um, looped under the dermatologic uh, toxicities, is you know you read about this can potentially cause secondary squamous cells, precancerous things like they're called keratoacanthomas or AKs, um, or even melanomas. These are extremely rare. So even though you may read it in the drug information, even though you may see this in packets of information that your doctor gives you, it really accounts for less than 2%. And really most of that it would be superficial squamous cells. Those are easily taken care of. Um, part of follow-up for patients that are getting BRAF and MEK inhibitors is to actually do a skin exam. One, to check for rashes, but two, to look for these secondary squamous cells. Removing them is really the treatment. So if any of these things come up, an area that doesn't heal, an area that is bleeding on your skin, certainly point that out to your physician um, because they should biopsy it and remove it if it, if it looks precancerous. Um, but I just wanted to waylay that fear because I get that question quite a bit. Um, less than 1% of all patients that are treated with BRAF MEK inhibitors will develop new melanoma. So that's something that um, you shouldn't be worrying about. There's a more rare side effect um, that is dermatologic. It's called paniculitis, and it's an inflammation of like the fat layer of the skin. Um, the way that this presents, and, and some of the people that are actually watching, I know you know what this is, um, it presents as like a red or painful lump under the skin. Um, it can look sometimes like a subcutaneous metastasis. So it's something that if you get something like this that is a red bump and it's under your skin and it's painful, you should show your physician, but it may be paniculitis. Um, a lot of times these appear most commonly on the extremities and the buttocks. Um, you may or may not get a fever with this. Um, it may or may not respond to topical steroids. That's the first thing that we would try. Um, if the topical steroids don't work, then typically what will happen is we'll hold your dose and give you oral steroids. Um, that typically will fix it. Also, dose reduction will fix this. So a lot of times even just adjusting the dose, just one dose tier, um, will take care of this quite readily. Um, there are occasional people that will need, if it recurs, even after the dose reduction, Sometimes we'll need a very, very low dose of daily steroid, like five milligrams, um, and that's enough to really control those symptoms, but also not, um, not harmful to the treatment itself. So that's one thing to really point out, um, now that I say it out loud, is that taking steroids when you're taking BRAF and MEK inhibitors doesn't have that same um, blockade effect as having steroids when you're taking something like a checkpoint inhibitor like um, the pd1 inhibitors and ctla4 so um, a lot of times you know folks are afraid to take steroids to treat some of these symptoms because of the fact that um, they've been warned not to take steroids while they're getting immunotherapy but in this particular case steroids don't seem to have that same type of effect um, on treatment so it is okay to use you know steroids when necessary to treat the symptoms um, <clears throat> the diagnosis of paniculitis um, is really a pathologic diagnosis but it again is something that you you know if you have a lump that is painful you should bring that to the attention of your doctor um, as far as the next most common side effect that we see with um, BRAF and MEK inhibitors would be GI toxicities, which would include things like diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Um, one of the first things that you want to do, um, you see this a lot more commonly with the Vemucobi combination um, and sort of equal amounts in, in the DT or the Dibrafenib, Trematinib, and, and Gobini. Um, 
But one of the first things that you want to do is rule out that there are other reasons to have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, like infections, elevated liver functions, um, tumor um, can sometimes create those kinds of things, especially if they're in the small bowel, um, or abnormalities in hormones like cortisol or adrenal insufficiency. Um, so that's the first thing that we would want to do um, if you call us with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. A lot of times these types of side effects will occur within like the first four weeks and sometimes they actually go away on their own without any kind of intervention. So we really try to support patients through this first like month um, to try to avoid doing an unnecessary dose reduction. So we, what do we do to do that? We'll recommend, we are going to talk about joint pain, Karen, don't worry. Um, you want to really hydrate um, to avoid dehydration. We really want to try to use things like Imodium and Lamotil. Um, because they're actually really effective at controlling diarrhea from these types of agents. Um, Zofran for nausea. Um, one thing I will say about drugs like Zofran is that they sometimes can prolong the QTC interval, which is we'll talk about a little bit later with cardiac toxicity, but it certainly can um, do that. So we want to use it sparingly, but we also don't want you to be throwing up. So um, Zofran is something that... Um, your doctor would prescribe to you if you have quite a bit of, of nausea. Um, if we kind of get you through that first four weeks, but you're still having a lot of these types of GI symptoms, the doctor then would need to dose reduce. Um, but truly, we try things like a brat diet, you know, eating bland foods, making sure that you're um, doing things like toast and apples and, but you know, applesauce and um, boiled chicken and not using a lot of things that are spicy, um, making sure you increase your fiber, um, you know, to bulk up your stools and for sure making sure that you're doing a good job of hydrating. Um, if at any point you have a fever with diarrhea, that certainly is a reason to contact your doctor right away, um, especially to rule out things like, you know, C. diff or other kinds of, of colon infections. Um, one of the next most common toxicities that we see is, is fever. Um, fever tends to be one of the tougher um, side effects to treat, um, at least in our experience, in terms of, um, you know, patients feel really terrible. Um, so at, oh, I, can't, I don't want to pronounce your name wrong, and, um, fever and pyrexia is a common side effect. You actually see it more with um, mechanist and tafenlar with like the dibrafenib trametinib um, folks. Um, but again, you know, it's something that can sometimes be extremely hard to control. It also some is a side effect that happens within the first um, four weeks. Um, fevers can be really high. They can be upwards of like 102, 103 degrees. Um, there's not really a mechanism um, that is easily explained as to why this happens. Um, essentially, treating the fever as you would any other fever alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen, um, taking a you know tepid bath, putting um, an ice pack on the back of the neck, um, not bundling up when you're feverish. Um, all of those things are ways to combat that. What we oftentimes see is that a patient will take their dose, they'll develop a fever an hour or two later, the fever kind of waxes and wanes over the next couple of hours, and then it's time for the next dose. So when we have things like that happening, a lot of times we'll hold um, there's been a lot of experience with like taking a drug holiday when you get to those kinds of things for leave in just two days will sometimes um, break the cycle of that fever and you get another you know couple of weeks of of therapy without really needing to dose reduce so that's one option the other option is to try um, a dose reduction you can always re-escalate the dose if the fevers get in better control the longer that you're on therapy um, some folks have, have tried doing things like intermittent treatment where they do two weeks on and two weeks off. Um, there is some data that says that that's not super great for people that have metastatic disease in terms of continuing the response, but in an adjuvant setting, um, that has been sometimes used, um, in these problematic fever patients that, you know, have a hard time regulating their temperature and the fever is just unrelenting despite dose reduction. So there's a lot of things that you know, and the good thing is, is there's a lot of things that doctors can do to try to abate, especially this type of, of symptoms. We've had patients that, um, you know, pre-medicate themselves about a half an hour, 40 minutes before they're dosing. Um, some people have had a lot of success with switching um, 
switching around like the time of day that they take their their meds um if you're getting a fever and it's chronic, obviously fluids are super important. That goes kind of without saying. Um, it is okay to use both ibuprofen and, and Tylenol um, as you know, spoken with your doctor. They've even, in really terrible cases, used low-dose steroids as well, but obviously we try to avoid that when possible. Um, I see a lot of comments coming through about arthritis, and that's actually the next thing I'm gonna talk about. Um, Musculoskeletal side effects tend to take a little longer to happen, but they also tend to be extremely annoying and, and patients complain about them all the time. Now, when we see um, joint pain, a lot of times at first it'll be migratory. And what I mean by that is like, someone will say like, well, my hip hurts, but then the next day my knee hurts, and then the next day my ankle hurts, and sometimes my shoulder hurts. Sometimes we have people that say that they have a really hard time like writing, their hands get really uncomfortable. Um, Nicole, you can contact me outside of the, um, not to get distracted, um, but about the fever and having persistent low grade. There's other things that they can try. So if you if you wanna call the 1-800 number um, or send me a form on the AIM website, I certainly can try to work through some of those things with you. Um, so in terms of, of joint pain, a lot of times in the beginning when people start first getting joint pain, it's not going to settle in one particular place. This is when things, if the symptoms are mild, um, things like Aleve or um, other NSAIDs will extremely be helpful um, in terms of, of helping abate that because it's not in a specific place. Um, or even like a low dose steroid, like five to 10 milligrams of prednisone once a day can sometimes be extremely helpful and take care of those symptoms right away. Um, if you're getting into where you're having severe joint pain where you're not walking or you can't button your shirt or you know things get extremely painful where you're you're limiting your activities of daily living like even just dressing yourself um that really would constitute holding the drug trying a dose reduction even giving a few days of high dose steroids to try to calm down the inflammation and kind of get back to a place of baseline um one thing that we found is extremely effective and again this isn't how every you know, oncologist or treating physician is going to treat their patient, but we found that when patients have severe side effects, whether they're from arthritis or any of the other things we've talked about, um, the most helpful thing is hold the drug, get the side effect under control, and then restart either at the same dose or at a lower dose. But trying to treat the side effects while continuing to dose the drug just kind of creates this you know, potentiating circle that can't be broken and you can't really ever get a good control over it. So um, outside of a very mild rash, most of the time if we're considering intervening with a medication that is not over the counter, we try to hold the drug. Um, when the joint pain tends to settle in a specific place, like say your shoulder or, you know, I had a, a patient that had persistent right shoulder pain. Um, what's really actually extremely helpful is to do a joint injection. Um, if the joint space itself is swollen with a, which an orthopedics doctor, a doctor that specializes in bones and muscles can see on an x-ray um, or a CT scan or MRI, they can drain that fluid out. So um, Lori, I see that you mentioned that you've had things drained and that can be extremely helpful because sometimes the joint pain comes from an overproduction of normal fluid that is happening because of inflammation. And sometimes it happens because that actual joint space is, is inflamed then maybe isn't causing it to swell. And that's when the injection of, of the, it's like a combination of steroid and lidocaine um, will be extremely ex effective. And, and again, in, jo in joint injection, and you'll see me talk about this um, next time when we talk about the side effects of the checkpoint inhibitors, um, injecting into a joint space is actually okay because it's a contained space. So that steroid is not systemic. It's an extremely effective way to target when there is a specific place that's hurting. Um, as far as you know, the muscular end of it, um, you know, some people will complain of just like a whole lot of pain in their you know calves or in their thighs. Um, we see NSAIDs, um, high doses of ibuprofen, like 800 milligrams at a time, um, be extremely effective for that, um, as well as low doses of methotrexate. Now, this is where our clinic likes to get rheumatology involved because there are that's 
their specialty. Um, they will rule out, you know, things that could still commonly happen, like you develop rheumatoid arthritis later in life. Um, so, you know, using dose, you know, disease modifying agents like methotrexate and um, um, levulonamide, which is another um, disease modifying, like almost that you see this most commonly used in things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, these kinds of drugs are extremely effective in treating um, muscle pain and joint pain in both checkpoint inhibitors and the BRAF MEK inhibitors, but that's something that really a specialist should be dealing with. So we try to do as much as we can in our clinic um, outside of using these agents, and when that doesn't work, we certainly, you know, would send you to a specialist. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are the cardiac side effects. These are a little bit more specific, um, and part of it is is part of what we do in our clinic in terms of following patients over time. So um, one of the things, and especially, <coughs> excuse me, the MEK inhibitors can do is decrease um, the effectiveness of the pumping of the ventricle. So what's that, what that is called is the ejection fraction. Um, and the ejection fraction is a percentage typically. Um, and so what our specific clinic does in this is not necessarily standard in all places. So don't panic if you didn't do this. Um, but we typically get an echocardiogram um, which is an ultrasound of the heart to measure this ejection fracture or pumping fraction um, at the very beginning prior to starting treatment. And then we do ours every two months. Um, most of the time, these signs of side effects or decrease in, in pumping ability happen within like the first five to six months of treatment. Um, they can happen as early as two weeks. This is not a common side effect, but it's something that, um, if it occurs, is extremely worrisome. Now, there is some data um, in some of the readings that I did. Um, folks were only doing echocardiograms if patients had symptoms like lower extremity swelling, hand swelling, um, which is called peripheral edema, facial swelling, or significant changes in their um, cardiac function, like uh, exertional shortness of breath, chest pain. Um, we tend to take uh, a little bit more of a preventative approach, but again, you know, there's no right or wrong way to, to skin a cat. Um, so we would do an echo at baseline so that we have something to compare to this. And really, that makes good sense no matter what, because then you know if someone starts to have symptoms, what changed, certainly. Um, Cardiac issues can be more common um, with, at least with the ejection fraction on dibrafenib and trametinib, um, but they can, in terms of severity, like we see more severe complications with their, them um, than Vemucobi and then Ancobini. So in that kind of order, I mean, to answer your question, you also asked about um, switching treatment to another targeted therapy if the pyrexia or the fevers persist, and that is something that is extremely helpful. So sometimes if if one of the combinations is causing a specific um, side effect that is intolerable, um, sometimes instead of dose reducing multiple times, we'll switch to a different agent that doesn't seem to have um, that particular side effect as one of their main things. Um, I'm trying to be extremely neutral <laughs> in terms of um, the three types of BRAF MEK inhibitors, which is why I'm trying to avoid talking about that, but, but certainly switching agents to a different grouping is extremely helpful as a tool as well. Uh, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, so the other cardiac side effect that is sometimes seen um, is an increase in the QTC interval. And I'm not a cardiologist, but the best way that I can describe it is the amount of time that it takes to repolarize from the top of the to the bottom of the heart. The reason that that's bad is the longer the QTC interval, the more likely that some type of really dangerous arrhythmia could occur. So you want that to be really short. Um, the only thing that I can say is that there are some, the reason that that's important is that some medications can cause a prolonged QTC interval already. And then when you have those medications on board and you're adding um, especially the BRAF MEK inhibitors, it can cause that to kind of be pushed over the edge and can sometimes create issues. So the things that we screen for are antidepressants like Ralbutrin, Cymbalta, um, Zofran, 
And some of the anti-nausea medicines can cause that. Um, Cipro, um, which most people are not taking daily Cipro, but Cipro can cause um, this QTC to um, happen as well. Karen, you should tune in 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 a month because I'm going to talk about Ipi and Nevo um, side effects next time. Um, So if you see that your patients are on those medications, um, that would be an indication to do an EKG as well, just to make sure that that QTC interval isn't already prolonged. Um, Other things can also cause that, like electrolyte abnormalities, vomiting. So um, that's something to keep in mind if, if like cardiac symptoms start to occur, like chest pain or dizziness. Those are all always things that we would check. Um, So Mick, you say, I've been on Braftovi Mectovi for 12 months. Should I have had my heart checked in that time? So every clinic, and this is exactly what I'm saying, every clinic is a little bit different. So if you haven't had any side effects um, in terms of um, swelling, chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath that's increased, um, some physicians aren't doing that. So that it's, it's one thing that like there's not a, an exact set of guidelines. The reason that our clinic does the things that they do is because we were part of the clinical trials and that was something that was required. Um, it, depending on where you read things, sometimes it is a requirement, um, but certainly you shouldn't panic if you haven't had any cardiac testing, especially if you haven't had any side effects. One thing to note is that these cardiac abnormalities, even if you do get them, they will resolve as soon as you hold the medicine. So they're not they're not considered to be permanent side effects. So even if you were to develop those or if you've stopped treatment, you're not going to develop them after you stop. So I hope that helps. Um, Terry, yes, seizure meds can also increase the QTC interval. So those are all kind of things. And and that's part of what the pharmacists, you know, help us with to make sure that there aren't any side, you know, drugs that will cause any kind of, com- you know, concomitant issues. Um, one thing that I do really want to talk about um, as well before I'm done um, are the ocular side effects. And I know we're running a little bit over what I normally do, but um, we've had a lot of recent people that have had more and more ocular toxicities. And so there's a couple different ways that this can manifest itself. Um, The most common one is actually um, what's called conjunctivitis or um, uveitis, which is an inflammation of the front part of like either the iris of your eye, which is the colored part, the white part, which is conjunctivitis, um, or like the lens. And the way that that sort of manifests itself is like a foreign body sensation in your eye or an inflammation, like feeling like you need to rub your eye all the time. Sometimes it'll even be red. Sometimes it'll be tearing. Um, a lot of times it's in both eyes. Um, sometimes that that irritation can cause visual changes, but most often the symptoms of that are, are really irritative. Um, the treatment for that is actually pretty simple. It's just prednisolone drops, which are prednisone steroid drops um, that you have to put in your eye um, every couple of, well, at first it's quite frequent, but then after that it's like twice a day. Um, always ophthalmology should be involved with any kind of ocular symptoms because it can cause some you know, damage in terms of scarring and things like that if it's left unchecked. Um, but that first part is actually pretty easy to treat. So prednisolone almost always takes care of it. Very rarely will dose reductions need to happen from that anterior sort of irritation. Um, that side effect can actually occur within days to weeks of taking medicine. And sometimes it's asymptomatic and you just get red eyes, but it's something that somebody will notice because if you come and you have like two bloodshot eyes, somebody's going to say something about it. Um, the other ocular toxicity that occurs that can be extremely more worrisome because it does cause sometimes pretty profound vision loss or vision change um, or blurred vision um, is something called serous retinopathy and it's actually a, a fluid accumulation that happens underneath the retina which is the back part of your eye that you can't see that only ophthalmologists can see when they look in there um, it's actually where all your blood vessels are for your eye it's also where um, the color vision comes from it's also where light bounces so that you can see so having um, fluid in between that layer can be extremely one dangerous because it can detach your retina but two it can cause um, pretty profound changes in vision so if for some reason 
all of a sudden you have blurred vision or loss of color vision or a shadow in your visual field or um, sometimes people will complain of like flashing of light um, you really should immediately be seen by an ophthalmologist or your physician to get you to an ophthalmologist um, it is a common side effect in that we see this most frequently with people who are on BRAF and MEK inhibitors. So um, do you have to have regular eye exams? Not necessarily, but certainly if there is any kind of change in your visual field um, or acuity at all, you should, you should for sure let someone know. Um, are eye side effects more common with BRAF Um There are certain ones that are symptoms that are braf you see a lot of the time i mean uh, let me re go back braf and mech cause different eye issues but they're all common throughout the same like they're not exclusive to one particular grouping these ocular side effects can occur with any of the three groupings of um the braf mech inhibitors um that was in reference to um the question that came across. I can't see who gave it now. It's too far back. Um, so either of them can cause it, just so that you know, like any of the three groupings can cause these side effects. Um, if for some reason there's one particular thing that happens that should mean that you stop BRAF mech inhibition altogether, and that's something called retinal vein occlusion, which is actually where the vein that drains your eye um, is blocked. Um, the reason for that is it is extremely dangerous. It can cause blindness. Um, and so even though it's extremely rare, if for some reason you would have a change in vision and that's what they decide it's from, you should not take BRF mech inhibitors anymore of any grouping. Um, okay, so I've been trying really hard to answer a lot of these questions as we've been going along because you guys have been very, very good at asking them when I'm talking about that specific Topic, but let me go back really fast and make sure that there's nothing that we missed. Karen um, Sheffield, just to tell you, um, I did mention that I'm going to be talking about the side effects of, of nivolumab and IPI, but you can't dose reduce those. But we'll talk about joint pain whenever I do that lecture in a couple weeks. Um, we talked about the cardiac issues are really with all of them. I think we got it by goodies. So if there's anything else that comes up or you have any other additional questions, um, I'm always available. Um, I know that Kathleen um, or AIM actually posted my contact information. So um, you can reach me by my 1844 number. You can reach me by going on to the web page and filling out a form with your question. Um, you can also actually reach me through the chat feature if for some reason you can't find out how to get a hold of me any other way. Um, on AIM's website, there's a chat feature. You can actually type your question in there as well. Um, but AIM at Melanoma actually reposted the link. You can just click on that. It'll take you right to me. So um, Karen, you should definitely reach out. Anybody else that has any questions, I'm always here to try to help. Um, you know, again, these are just recommendations. Um, Miriam, these drugs are for melanoma, um, for treating, you know, melanoma. Oh, of course, every time I try to end, there's a hundred more questions. Um, let me read this really fast. Hold on. So Mick, if you have vision where the ground is all wavy, but then it clears up in a few minutes, you should definitely tell your doctor about that because they should have you do a, um, a quick, um, ophthalmologic exam and just kind of make sure there's no swelling or anything in the back of your eye. That's always helpful to do because having w that wavy vision can sometimes indicate that there is a, a fluid ac accumulation. It could also be something simple like oc ocular migraines or um, sometimes people got floaters, but, but that, those are all things that they can diagnose at an ophthalmologist. Um, Debbie, you definitely can have hair loss. It's not super common. Um, like it is with chemotherapy. And it actually it happens due to keratinization or hardening of the hair follicle. Um, sometimes people will say their hair grows out curly. And that's just because the hair follicle kind of gets damaged with um, keratin or gets dry. And then the hair either falls out because it's sad or it comes out curly. 
Um, no, Miriam, there's not a blood test to tell if your melanoma um, has spread just yet. There are, is some data with using BRAF as a blood test, but that's another whole lecture altogether. Um, mm -hmm. And Susan, is Tafmex something you can take indefinitely after removing tumors? So usually when Tafilar and Mechanist are used in an adjuvant or preventative setting, it's for a period of one year. Um, that's what was studied to get FDA approval. So um, in, an, in a setting where you're using it to prevent your melanoma from coming back, that period is typically one year. If it's being used to treat metastatic disease, and that holds true for all of these um, agents, all drug combinations um, in a metastatic setting, it can actually be taken forever indefinitely as long as side effects are um, managed. Let me just see if there's any other big ones that I don't before I sign off. <sighs> Miriam, you should contact me outside of here and we can talk about it because it, it's it's something that actually will take a really long time to try to explain and it's actually still in clinical trials. So it's not um, it's not a mainstream test that you can just like go to your doctor and ask them to run. So just so you know, Karen, sometimes melanomas will work her. You're correct. Um, but again, if you have questions about that, you certainly can then contact me outside of, of here. So I'm going to actually sign off because um, we have a long questions. I hope that everybody had, you know, this was helpful to people. If you have other specific questions about your side effects, I'm certainly here to help. All right. I hope you have a wonderful night. See you later.